Welcome to our Kids Bible Study for Sunday, July 7th, 2024. I'm calling this one, Jesus Calls His First Disciples. We've been going over what uh, Jesus' life is, and you've got four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all tell about Jesus. They all bring up different stories. And what I'm trying to do is just give you the what happened in the order they happened in. And it's kind of hard to do that because... Uh, you know, you don't know exactly how it all works, but we're going to try our best. So last time we were in Luke chapter 4, and we saw that Jesus, after he was baptized by John the Baptist, he received the Holy Ghost, and then for 40 days he was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, and when he came out of the wilderness, he went back to his home church, synagogue there in Nazareth and we talked last time in Luke 4 verses 14 through 29 we saw that uh, he read Isaiah 61 and said that he is the Messiah and for that they tried to kill him and they would have succeeded except that God says it's not that's not how it's going to work so Jesus just sort of escapes through their hands and they can't explain it because God made sure that he got out of there and so then what he does is he goes down into uh, Capernaum, a city of Galilee. So now what we're going to do is we're going to pick up here, If we're, we're going to look in John chapter 1, because there are some events that happen in John 1 that are before um, we get back to Luke. And in John chapter 1, we know that John the Baptist was called by uh, God to, be, to prepare the way for Jesus. And we went through that, how he was out in the wilderness and he was calling people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So they were stop, supposed to stop trusting in their own righteousness and trust in God to save them. And then they were supposed to get water baptized so that they are now separated as believers from the rest of the nation. The biggest problem that Jesus has and what John has also is that most people won't follow him. Most people try to get rid of him. We already saw that last week. He goes back to his home church. But they say, well, no, he's not the Messiah. And they would rather believe what man says, what the religion said, rather than what God's word said. So when Jesus says he's the Messiah, then they try to kill him. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look in John chapter 1, and we know that John the Baptist was called uh, to prepare the way. He started his ministry in the wilderness, baptizing people for six months. And then Jesus, we already saw that, that Jesus was baptized by John and he is, uh, receives the Holy Ghost and 40 days in the wilderness, tempted by the devil, he comes back. Well, here, he's already come back now, I think, and uh, is what happens. And it says in John 1 and verse 35, John 1, 35, it says, Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, so John had his own disciples, John the Baptist. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Now he had said that before in verse 29, John 1 verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So these people had been following John the Baptist, seeing that he was preparing the way for the Lord. And now he says, uh, now there is now here is the Messiah Jesus the Lamb of God he's going to take away your sin so verse 37 it says the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus uh, they said okay well we're following John because he's leading the way to our Messiah well now John says Jesus is the Messiah so let's follow him you know that's who you'd follow the Messiah so verse 38 Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, well, what seek ye? In other words, you know, it's funny because what man does is man tries to draw a crowd. You know, if you start a church, let's say you start a new church, they'll send out things in the mail. They'll say, oh, come to our church. Or they'll put an ad in the paper. Or they'll put advertisement on TV. And they spend this money and they try to get everybody to know, hey, here's our church, you need to come to us. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus was there to fulfill, to be that Messiah, to live a perfect life, to take our sin upon himself, and to die for our sins. And here, the first two people that follow him, which is Andrew and 
Peter, Jesus says, what do you want? <laughs> Why are you following me? <laughs> they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? So they said, well, you're our master, Rabbi, you're our master because you're our Messiah. So that's why we're following you. So we want to stay where you are. So where are where do you dwell? Verse 39, he saith unto them, come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. So it was late in the day when he saw him. And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is, which is by interpretation a stone. Now, he hasn't called his twelve disciples yet. You, this is just right at the first, the beginning of his ministry, which is why we're reading this now. And he has, so Andrew and Peter follow Jesus. So John 1, uh, verse uh, 40 and uh, 40, uh, 40, well, we'll say 39 through 41. Well, we'll do this. So John 1, 39 through 41, Andrew and Peter find Jesus. And they see he is the Messiah. And so then, you go down to verse 43, and it says, The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. A lot of people think that Peter or Andrew were the first disciples called, but really, you see with Andrew and Peter, they're the ones that found Jesus. And Jesus says, What are you looking for? Well, you're our master. Where are you going to dwell? And then they bowed with him. You see, Peter and Andrew were the ones who came to Jesus. But with Philip, Philip, Jesus found Philip and said, follow me. So the first one, now Philip ends up being one of the 12 disciples. The first disciple, first disciple called by Jesus is Philip. I know Andrew and Peter found him, but it's Philip. But Jesus told Andrew and Peter, well, what do you want? But with Philip, he found Jesus, found Philip, and told Philip, hey, follow me. So he did. You notice in verse 44, Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So all three of these guys come from the same city. And then there's another guy named Nathaniel. It says that Philip, verse 45, findeth Nathaniel and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, they don't understand he's not the son of Joseph. He's the son of Mary, and his father is God. But anyway, at first, this is at the first, so they think he is the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. When you're reading the book of John, that phrase, come and see, you'll see that a lot. We saw that with Andrew and Peter. Jesus told them, uh, where do you stay? He said to them, come and see. So we see that in John 1 and verse 39. And now we see it uh, with uh, Philip telling Nathaniel, come and see. And the idea is, the reason this is important is basically, don't just follow the religious leaders. Come and see for yourself. Come, basically, to God, away from religion. Come away from religion. And then see, see what God is doing. And this is the lesson that we can understand. Because there's plenty of churches out there you know, when you, when I was a kid, you're just going to, you know, you'll follow whatever your parents follow because that's what you do. You know, you don't really have a choice. But when you become an adult, you'll have a choice where you could say, I could go to the Baptist church, the Methodist church, the Presbyterian church, the Catholic church, the Lutheran church, the Nazarene church, the, 
uh, Pentecostal church, the Assembly of God church, all these churches out here. You can go to anyone you want. But what you should do is follow what Jesus said and follow what Philip said here. Come and see. In other words, don't follow man. Don't follow what a denomination or a church says. But come to God. Come to God's Word and see what God is doing. And what God is doing is He sent His Son to die for your sins. And when you trust that Jesus died for your sins, then, um, then, you, then God gives you the gift of eternal life. A church cannot do that for you. Only God can give you eternal life so that when you die, you get to be with God forever in heaven. And Jesus did that. So we want to come to God in the Bible and see what God is doing. It's not, we shouldn't be picking and saying, well, I'll follow the Presbyterians or the Methodists or the Nazarenes or the Baptists. We shouldn't be doing that. We should say, I'm going to follow God. I'm going to come and see what God is doing. And that's why that phrase is there in the book of John. John shows Jesus as God. So he's saying, come and see. So we've seen now that we've got four disciples introduced so far. Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. And Philip is the only one that uh, Jesus has said, follow me. So then, uh, now let's go over to Luke uh, chapter 4. Going back to where we were last week. And in Luke chapter 4 and verse 31. So Jesus was in Galilee and he was at his home church in Nazareth. But they tried to kill him. So he had to leave his hometown of Nazareth. And it says in Luke 4 and verse 31, Luke 4, 31, that he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath day. So he tried to teach the people in Nazareth, his home church, but they wouldn't listen to him because they already knew him. They said, this can't be the Messiah. We know his mother, Mary, and his father, Joseph. Now, Joseph isn't his father, but that's what they thought. He's been to our church all these years growing up. He's been coming here 30 years. That can't be the Messiah. They expect the Messiah to just, I guess, supernaturally come down from God. They don't expect him to be some, you know, miracle birth and then growing up and having to read God's word. And also, another thing about him is he didn't look, there was nothing special about him when you looked at him. You know, when you see somebody who is a, you know, a politician, let's say, or a celebrity sports player. I know when I was a kid, I lived three miles from Angel Stadium where the Angels played. And a lot of times I couldn't recognize the players when they didn't have their uniform on. Um, you know, if they had their uniform, they had the name on the back, I know who they are. But without that, I didn't know who they were. But what you could do is, so I'd be there before the game starts, and I'd bring a baseball and try to get them to sign my baseball. Well, I wouldn't recognize them, but you could tell sort of when they're coming in. They'd come in early. They'd come in through the player's entrance. But you could tell they look like athletes. You know, there's a certain way. It's a politician looks a certain way. Someone goes to church looks a certain way. The athlete looks a certain way. There are certain looks about them. And so when it comes to the Messiah, they're looking for him to stand out from everybody else. And maybe they don't know exactly what he's going to look like, but they think he's going to look special. But the thing about God is God doesn't want us to walk by sight what we see. He wants us to walk by faith, meaning to believe what he says in God's word. And don't look at it on the outward appearance. The God's, God's word says that God looks on the heart. He doesn't judge you on the outside, which is good. Because if God judged me based on how I looked on the outside, I wouldn't make it into heaven. I'm not a tall person. Um, I'm not good looking by this world's standards. Uh, I'm just an ordinary guy on the outside. I don't look special. But because God looks on the inside, it doesn't matter how you look on the outside. God says, well, you've been forgiven a sin because you trusted that Jesus died for your sin. And so I'm going to save you. And when it came to Jesus, one of the reasons why they didn't accept him as their Messiah is he didn't look special. In uh, Isaiah 53 and verse 2, Isaiah 53 and verse 2, talking about the Messiah, 
Jesus, it says he shall grow up before him. Jesus will grow up before God as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground, meaning you don't have a bunch of saved people there. Not many people trusting in God is what that means. And then it says, note it says, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. That verse there tells you that Jesus looked like an average guy. He wasn't tall. He wasn't good looking by this world standard. He just looked like an average guy. And so when people looked at him, they said, well, this guy can't be our Messiah there because he's grown up with Joseph and Mary 30 years. He can't be our Messiah. So then, but he, when he goes over to Capernaum, they don't judge him based on his looks on the outside because they don't know him. They haven't known him for 30 years. You know, back then, you didn't have cars and airplanes and things. So people, you just stay really in your village where you lived. You didn't go too far from home because if you're going to go somewhere, if you're poor, you had to walk. So you didn't go too far, you know. So he goes down to Capernaum in Luke 4.31, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. So he teaches them God's word, and they're believing it because they see he's the power of God's word. The religion that the Pharisees had went against God's word. They taught their own religion. But Jesus taught God's word, and so they were astonished at his word. And in verse 33, there was a man with an unclean spirit, and Jesus comes, and verse 35, in Luke 4, 35, Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him, and hurt him not. So this appears to be, I think anyway, Jesus' first miracle, if you want to call it that. Uh, Jesus, well, I guess, I mean, it is a miracle. Not like I could do this. <laughs> so we'll call it that. Jesus cast out a devil or a demon, whatever you want to call it, that was in that person. And it says in verse 36, they were all amazed, spake among themselves. And in verse 37, the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. So Jesus is becoming popular now because they see him cast out the devil and they see him teaching, um, teaching God's word. And it's not like the Pharisees who taught man's traditions. They taught God's Word. God's Word has power. God's Word can save us, give us life in heaven. And so now, they wouldn't see Him. Last week we saw that they would not recognize Jesus as Messiah in His home church. But when He goes to the city down the road, they give Him a chance. And they listen to what He teaches. And they see Him cast out a devil. So now, they're, uh, now people are starting to believe He is the Messiah. We're out of time. So let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank You for sending Jesus to die for our sins. We thank you that we don't have to follow a religion or a church, but we can just simply believe what your word says and then you will work inside us and your power of God will come through us to help others so that they also may go to heaven, believe the gospel and go to heaven. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we'll start up here next time. Thanks for watching.